Uh, feeling great today, mostly because of the performance enhancing drugs. So this should be fun. Uh, last night, about 10 o'clock, so I live on the East Coast, dealing with that. Uh, but I brought my family up this time to finally get to see Seattle and see the sights and meet the Mazers that uh, don't know too, not, too much about me, to uh, put in a bad word. And uh, they're kicking around and being assholes, kids do, uh, three, five, and seven. And I go in there, I'm like, look, daddy has got to talk to like a thousand people in the morning. You have got to go to sleep. And my oldest looks at me and she says, a thousand people? That's a lot. What if they don't like you? <laughs> I was like, sweetie, daddy's a black hat. He can always buy reviews. It'll be fine. Uh, but it's been a great time here in Seattle. Really looking forward to talking to you today. I have the unenviable task of uh, discussing with you data, and not even the cool parts of data. I know uh, Brittany's going to be talking later about machine learning, awesome stuff you can do there, and Will's going to be talking about data visualization. Uh, but I'm going to focus just on the data itself. So there's probably like 5% of you in here who are pretty excited about this talk. I wouldn't tell anyone that. It's not good for your marriage or your relationships. Uh, you just keep that on the down low because it's about the least cool thing you could really be interested in. And the other 95% of you will, will get it and you'll understand it, but it's going to be a lot to digest really, really quickly. So first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I am principal search scientist at Moz. My primary responsibility has kind of morphed into data quality. When I first joined, I worked on Keyword Explorer, and we, we really wanted to improve uh, predictions for actual search traffic, and we realized there was a big quality gap there. And then slowly but surely, the research I did for that ended up making its way into other types of tools in our, um, in our product line. I also get to do a lot of research and development and proof of concept, which is a lot of fun. But, and it's hard to believe, my favorite task in Moz is specifically to ruin Dr. Pete's day. And, and, and just to really, like, I, I want to drive this home, because this is absolutely true. Uh, I am principal search scientist at Moz. I have never heard of anyone with the title principal in their name other than at school. But when I was talking with Adam, who is my boss at Moz, we were trying to figure out what to call me, uh, I knew that Dr. Pete has this incredible reputation across the industry as being like the science guy, like Bill Nye, the science guy of, uh, of, of, of SEO. And he's a doctor too, which is a, a little bit um, intimidating. So I said, well, what's his title? It's like, he's a marketing scientist. And then I went to a thesaurus and I found as many different words that sounded better or more important than marketing scientist and came up with principal search scientist. So now whenever we're put side by side, it appears as if there's some sort of hierarchy of scientists at Moz. And I've, I've traipsed myself or positioned myself above Dr. Pete. Um, and he's done. He's already given his talk, so he can't respond. So that works great for me. <laughs> so I've tried, given the amount of stuff that I've got to go through pretty quickly, to narrow down the talk to one really primary goal. And, and, and that's this, to cultivate an appreciation for data quality. One of the hardest things that our industry deals with is the fact that our foundational data, and when I, when I use foundational data, I'm talking about the, the raw stuff, the, not the pretty metrics like PA and DA uh, that you might deal with, but, but the, the data at the very bottom, the stuff that uh, is being collected by the tools that we use and then turned into things uh, that are valuable, that data is really messy. It is filled with holes, it is filled with biases, it is often misleading. And so today I want to talk through a bunch of issues with data and try and get you into position to appreciate quality data. Like, I want you to be like the, the wine snob of data. I want you to appreciate data the way snobs appreciate wine or Cyrus appreciates his hats or just any sort of thing like that where you just really love quality data. Uh, and the reason for that is because when there is bad information, it puts us into a unique situation. I, I wish I had reworded this because this is like a, a, a perfect Yoda saying. It should have been asymmetry bad information creates or something like that. But uh, instead, it's bad information creates asymmetry. And basically what that means is that when two different companies, you and your competitors, get the same bad data, but one of you realizes how to fix it or improve it, it creates an information asymmetry means that one of you is a little bit more informed than the other. And that asymmetry creates advantage. 
Let me explain that really, really quickly. Imagine that you and a competing firm have identical knowledge when it comes to how to implement the tactics that you're going to hear about and the strategies that you hear about all throughout the course of MOSCON. Let's say that you, you have, uh, you've somehow managed to hire sets of twins, identical twins, just as smart, read all the same books, all the same blog posts, same experience, et cetera. But one of you knows that Google Analytics has a particular bug that causes organic traffic to be uh, mislabeled. And we'll talk about that later. Well, it means that when you're trying to figure out how much money to invest into one of those tactics or strategies, you'll know to look at the correct labeling and realize that you need to invest a little bit more than your competitors do. So you'll make better decisions based on that quality. Now, how do we do this? How do we cultivate this appreciation for data quality? Well, I can only see one way. The first is just a big downhill slope of pointing out how horrible all of the data is that we rely upon. So for the first like 15 minutes of this presentation, I just want to disabuse you of any pretense that the data that you rely upon daily is good. It's not. And it's not to say it's not usable. It's not to say it's not valuable. But it, it has serious issues. And then after that, from the, the shambles of data that's left on the ground, uh, what we hope to do is r resurrect out of that an example, at least one, of how to use multiple data sources to produce a really quality metric. So stop being dumb with the data, but actually pull things together and, and be smart about it. So to begin, let's do the kickoff. Let me count the ways your data sucks. We're going to start with what everybody uses, Google Analytics, unless you like to pay for shitty data, which is fine too. Uh, but most of the different tools out there have similar types of gotchas that you're just not going to notice. Now, I'm going to run through these really, really quickly. So please do not try to like, take notes or whatever. The slides will be up later. Um, the whole point here is actually not to inform you at the beginning of specific issues. It's just to kind of make your stomach hurt a little bit. Like, just to feel uneasy about where you are in the world regarding data and, uh, that you rely on. And then we can talk about how we, how we un, undo those knots in your stomach. So Google Analytics, number one. First, Google Analytics often counts uh, real search engine crawlers as visitors. This is an example. There's an international search engine named Sogu. Now that they've decided to start crawling JavaScript, it's going to start counting in your analytics. Number two, Google mislabels well-known search engines. Ask.com. If it's a subdomain, Google doesn't count it as organic traffic, which means that if you're doing a great job in picking up search results from across the web, not just from Google or Bing or major search engines, it's missing out. In fact, I, I think the last count, Google only uh, looked at maybe 30 or 40 different search engines. DuckDuckGo wasn't one of them uh, in determining your organic traffic. Uh, what about Google Analytics coverage? Uh, I'm not sure if Tom has spoken yet, but he wrote a great blog post on this. Depending on your customers, how they've installed Google Analytics, and what the profile is of the browsers they're using, you're going to get different rates of impressions and visits and data, which is a huge issue because most of the time when a customer comes to you, you're looking at years of data, and you can't go back in time and fix their implementation, much less change the audience that's visited. Now, of course, uh, Jono, as soon as I mentioned this to him, who you know, spoke yesterday, uh, pointed out how that this isn't Google's problem. And I was like, thanks a lot. It still doesn't matter because you're stuck. You can't change this foundational data. There is no going back in time. There's no fixing it. But of course, it's not just Google Analytics. We use dozens of different types of tools. Google Search Console. I mean, this one. Holy shit. It does not get any worse than this. Uh, it, it, if my daughters ever used Google Search Console impression data or position data in a project or report, I would change my position on corporal punishment. I mean, this is just really horrible data. Let me give a quick example. Imagine you were running in the Olympics. You did 100 different races. And it was actually you. I mean, you're, you're probably going to lose every single race. But in the last race, it pretty much been identified who everybody was the best. Uh, so everybody went home. But you, you stuck around. And you ran the last race. You're the only participant. So of course, you take number one. And you, you walk up, and you stand on the podium. And you know, they, they put the medal on you, and it's great. And you send the picture home to mom, and don't tell her the truth. Uh, and it's great. But what actually happens then is that's when Google shows up. Google shows up with a camera, takes a picture of the podium. And that's what they're using to determine your average position. It's what I call a podium-first count. 
And what that means is that all of the races you lost so miserably that you never made to the podium don't matter. Let's give a better context. Let's imagine you uh, are really pissed off at your company because you're not ranking in the top 100 for any of your key terms. So you send out an email that night to all of your employees. And you're like, what are we doing? You're horrible, blah, blah, blah. Look, click here. You'll see that we don't rank for anything. Of, of course, they're going to see personalized search results. So they go and look. And, and that day, everybody is seeing you in position seven or eight because they're getting hyper-personalized results. Well, three days later, Google Search Console is going to tell you your average rank is like number six. And that's because they only count when an impression is made. If you rank 1,000 and nobody ever sees it, it doesn't count against you. It's like participation awards, but your participation doesn't count against you so that you only get counted when you win. Uh, this is about as garbage as a metric as could possibly be, um, but it's not the only one. There are tons of issues with Google Search Console. This was an experiment that was run with uh, a couple of friends of mine. Um, it turns out Google filters out a ton of long tail stuff, a ton of really great long tail stuff. And because of that, it means that even though people are searching for things, and it doesn't matter if they're logged in in a different browser, it's just not going to show up. You're just going to miss the data. There's other issues where Google will report things as not indexed. J.R. Oaks over at Adapt Partners did this great study where he found that up to 80% 80% of pages that were supposedly not indexed by Google, according to Google Search Console, were in fact in the index. And then what about links? Uh, if you use the live links data, or the, the, um, the sample links data from Google, Ana or Google Search Console, you're going to find out that it has a lot of dead links in it. In fact, it does worse than Moz, Majestic, and Ahrefs, which is nuts. Uh, Google is a far faster crawler than anything else on the internet. But just the time delay alone uh, between the time at which they get the data and they present it to you causes this problem. But if we're talking about links, let's not just harp on Google's linked data. I mean, there's linked data that you pay for. Surely, if you're paying all this money to Moz or Majestic or Ahrefs, you're getting great, perfect foundational data. Not a chance. We'll start with this one. Research that I did just a couple of months ago on the mobile first index uh, determined that roughly about 12% of the pages on the internet deliver different links if you have a mobile bot versus a desktop one. Well, none of the major index, not Moz, not Majestic, not Ahrefs, none of the minor indexes like uh, SEMrush or WebMeUp, none of them crawl with a mobile bot. Which means that now that mobile first is rolling out, different links are going to be in Google's index than the links that are in Moz's, Majestic's, or Ahrefs. But it's not like this is a new problem. We've always had an issue with inconsistent robots.txt. I mean, imagine like this part of the room blocks Majestic, this Ahrefs, this Moz, but everybody lets in Google. But what that ends up meaning is we all have just different link indexes. And if you're not using all of them, then you're missing out on certain links. And then the worst are these things that we, we like to call just black holes. I mean, a major hosting company just recently decided to block every non-search bot, didn't notify their customers other than in a blog post. Now, now, we're starting talks with them to see if we can fix this kind of issue. But if this hadn't come to our attention from a customer of ours, uh, we're in the same position as everybody else in the link, in, in the link index industry. We just don't know. And then there's spam. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I did cut my teeth doing black hat SEO. And but a decade or so ago, I thought spam was great because it made me money. But the reality is, is that it, it just fills up link indexes. Now, you, you're not going to be able to read this on the screen. This is what happens when you try to fit in 500 domains of a single spam link network into a page. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, but there's a lot of pages of this. In fact, it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on. I call this the Badminton Link Network. It's still live, still active, 16,000 plus domains. It's a Wikipedia scraper with infinite crawl depth, which means that every time you visit a page, it just randomly grabs something from Wikipedia and then links to it. And then it creates hundreds of millions of external links. And because of that, when you go and look at your foundational data, your like link counts, for example, they're going to be blown up if a link index hasn't done a good job of getting rid of this network. And this is just one. This is just one network. Now, we've talked about Google Analytics, and we've talked about Search Console. We've talked about links. Let's take a deep breath. Surely we've gotten rank tracking right. I mean, it's been, what, 15, 20 years since the first rank tracker was written? 
It can't be that hard. We're just searching Google. Unfortunately, this is such a moving target that we have teams at Moz just dedicated to looking at what's changed and how to fix it. This is one that almost nobody ever talks about, but it's a huge endemic problem across the industry. Rankings data changes based on the size of the SERP. If you get the top 50 search results, the featured snippet at the top can come from anywhere. Position 40, 50, 60, doesn't matter. What about the frequency of SERP features? What about whether or not there's a top stories? What about whether there's a featured snippet or a knowledge card? All of that can change. Now, luckily, Moz does what's called a double fetch. We get the true first page and the top 50, and we mesh it together. But almost no one in the industry does this. And because of that, it means that if you're getting rankings data that's anything other than the true first page, you're getting biased data. And then this one, this is just annoying as hell. Uh, Google has decided that everything should be geographically uh, related, at least some way or another. So if you tell Google that you're just generically in the United States, it puts you smack dab in Independence, Kansas. And you'll start getting results at the bottom of your page. Like you'll search for you know, restaurant and try to figure out you know, something related to restaurants that's nationwide. And at the bottom of it, it's going to have like the McDonald's in Independence, Kansas. What about Keyword Planner? We got keyword data. This one is really close to me because it's something that I've worked with the most over the last several years. And we know it's just straight up fucked. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Part of my French. Um, they, they group keywords differently in Keyword Planner than they do in SERPs. So if you're a football fan and you search for Texas A ampersand M, you're going to get a certain search result. And if you misspell that or put in an extra space, sometimes it'll correct it and say showing results for, sometimes it won't. But that's not the same as what they do in, in Keyword Planner itself. In Keyword Planner, they do different groupings. And then they group, which is in itself a problem. If you looked up SEO or search engine optimization, Google says, oh, they got the same volume. But the reality is that's, that's the two volumes combined. So if you go to a tool out there that relies on Google Keyword Planner volume, and then you say, OK, what are all the keywords I rank for? Chances are you're combining together volumes that have already been combined together. And it ends up with a really huge problem that we call disambiguation. What about click data? We are using click data more and more and more now. Um, CTR curves, you've all seen this. Dr. Pete's going to talk more about this in depth. But you know, in the first slide, you'll see a standard click-through rate curve, where the number one gets x percentage of clicks, the number two, y, and so on and so forth. But we know that changes radically based on SERP features. The second one is what happens if you have site links. The number one position gets almost 90% of the clicks. But it's not just how people click down that curve. It's also just the total clicks. This is uh, the total click-through rate. So like if 100 people showed up for a SERP, what percentage of people would actually just click on organic at all? Well, your standard no features is about 80%. That's not bad. But if there's a knowledge card on the page, it, it drops to 25%. What about personalization? Personalization is almost the hardest to pin down. We, we don't really have a good percentage metric for it yet, but we have an, in, an internal metric that we um, have built. And you'll see that if there's a local pack on the page, there's almost double the personalization of what you would expect, let's say, if there were no features at all or if there was a knowledge card. And that, that means that all of this data that you've been looking at telling you how many clicks you're going to get or, or, or how much money you're going to make and you're just doing these formulas are all ruined because the reality is far different from what is presented by these most basic numbers. But we have a solution, right? You've probably heard about clickstream data. I'm sure a lot of you have read some blog posts on Moz. And now, uh, now Ahrefs and SEMrush are using clickstream data to improve their models. Nope. Not really that good either. Turns out the most uh, important, or at least most popular clickstream data source has 0% Mac and 0% iOS traffic. That means that we are fixing our bad data with more bad data. Luckily, we know this bias, so we can solve some problems with it. But all this amounts to is just a giant data train wreck, just a huge, massive problem. Everything that we rely upon, all of this foundational data, is just filled with holes and problems and bugs. Just, it's just crap. And so what do we do? Well, we've got about five minutes left, and we're going to try and solve one problem, just one. If you're an agency or you're in-house, you've probably been asked at some point or another, how many clicks are we going to get if we just rank position x for this term? So we're going to look at what happens if you rank number three for ROI. So what do we need to know? What's the foundational data that we're starting with? 
Well, we need to know what the click-through rate is, position three. Oh, that's easy, right? We solved that like 20 years ago when we started doing eye tracking and all that kind of stuff, right? Should be easy. We need to know the search volume. Even easier, log into Google and it'll tell us. Great, right? This is what we used to do. This is what everybody would do. We'd have a standard click-through rate curve. We'd circle you on the graph. Then we'd go to Keyword Planner and we'd circle your volume. we just multiply them together and there you go. Great, perfect, grand, we're all done. But we know this is wrong. We know this is completely wrong. We just went over this. First, click-through depends on SERP features. We already talked about how that, that curve changes based on what different SERP features are there. So instead of just using one click-through curve, we need to look at a huge array of potential click-through curves. Not just what happens when you have one SERP feature, but when you have a huge combination of them. So given SERP features A, B, and C, like it's, it's got ads, it's got site links, it's got a knowledge panel, what is that click-through curve? Turns out there's a lot of those, more than the people in this room by far. So how do we solve this? Well, luckily, Dr. Pete is actually he's kind of smart. He's kind of smart, dude. Uh, so we worked together on a project pulling together huge data and then did some you know, magic finagling with machine learning. And we can end up with a way to predict novel arrangement click-through curves, which is pretty awesome. But that's only one of the issues. You know, we could come up with that specific click-through curve, but we also know that the total organic matters as well. It's not just the curve, but how big is the pie in the first place? Well, that means we got to do the whole damn thing again, except just for organic click-through rate. So we just looked at this graph a second ago. We need to figure out what happens when there's a local pack and a knowledge card, or a local pack and site links. We also know it depends on personalization, so there's a third part too. It gets even harder, it gets even deeper. And so we have to do the whole damn thing again, just for personalization. And we can once again come up with these novel arrangements of what the personalization rate is. Um, it's pretty amazing to see, for example, if there is a movie box, like because there's some sort of movie that's recently come out, your chances of getting a click from that SERP, is, even if you have the best site, is less than 1%, ranking number one. And, and the reason is because they're showtimes. And once people see a showtime, they click on that. Uh, we call it host diversity, and it's a, it's a metric that can tell us just how few and far between. Now, before we put that aside, just imagine what this means for a site like weather.com. Pretty much every weather-related search has a knowledge card. It has that giant thing right there in the middle, sunshine, rain, 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 Seattle rain. Uh, actually, it's been kind of nice here. But that means that every single SERP that they rank for, for the most part, only gets a 25% click-through rate to organic. So they've got to quarter their estimates from the beginning if they want to be accurate. Finally, volume depends on disambiguation. We figured out the click part. But now we've got to figure out what percentage of the volume is actually dedicated to this keyword as opposed to the 30 keywords that are grouped together. I did an analysis of a uh, leading um, keyword uh, provider outside of Moz uh, right before I joined when this disambiguation problem came out. 47% of their keywords were grouped when Google put in this algorithm. That meant that on average, every time you pulled two keywords, that were related to one another, their volumes were already going to be grouped together, which meant that they had this enormous, enormous boost in estimated search volume. It was just all wrong. Now, like I said, we use click data to solve this problem at Moz, a uh, simple formula where we take real click uh, data from our, uh, our click stream provider and then run this formula. And ultimately, after all of that work, we come up with a new formula. And I'm not asking you to like, memorize it or look at it. In fact, this is just a generic kind of understanding. But instead of just a simple curve times volume equals traffic, we've got complex machine learned functions for every little bit of the process. It's not just uh, multiplying two numbers together anymore. We're talking about huge amounts of data, all with the simple goal of telling you one number. 3,218. That's how many clicks we think you'll get at number three for ROI. All that work for just one number. And that's what I mean by appreciating data quality. 
So much effort going into giving you the right answer. Now, if you take the number out of Google Planner and multiply it by a normal click-through curve, you're going to get more than three times that because Google groups together the keywords ROI, R period, O period, I period, return on investment, all the misspellings of return on investment, all of the potential similar acronyms that Google thinks are related. And it's going to ruin your estimates and your strategies and your targets, and your competitor's going to know better. At least one of them will. So what are the takeaways? Number one, examine. Examine all of your data sources closely and carefully. At the end of the day, you have a responsibility to yourself, your company, and your customers. Number two, inform them. Let them know. This will give you the flexibility and the leeway that you need so that when you do run a campaign, you can tell them, look, there's a margin of error here that we just can't beat. And that margin of error is the slack that you need so that you can be creative. And finally, demand. When you see something wrong at Moz, tell me. Send us an email. Tell us that we demand better data from all of our providers. And so if I leave you with anything, just demand less sucky data. You're paying for it. You deserve it. Have a great MozCon. Thanks.